You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul explains the way in which the serpent twists the command of God in Genesis. Shifting to the New Testament, he continues that it is the command of Yahweh Elohim, not theology, that is central to St. Paul's letters. These letters address the problem of human behavior, not the correct phraseology of human words. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Genesis chapters 2 and 3 are conceived against this background of the issuance of the law and then look ahead to it. So you have the seeds that will be developed, namely that as I commented at the end of chapter 4, Yahweh is connected with the law, is the deity of the law and the command. Notice the following points. Number one, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the books of the law, are replete with the phrase commanded Moses or Moses and Aaron and through him or through them the people. Of note, the following instances. Let's hear them quickly. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Exodus 12, 28. Thus did all the people of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Exodus 12:50. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord God had commanded him, Exodus 19.7. And all over these four books, and we all know the importance, the centrality of the command issued by Yahweh Elohim in Genesis 2. Another point, in Genesis 2, The first verbal interaction between the deity and the newly formed human being is a command by Yahweh Elohim to the man. Why saw Yahweh Elohim, which is exactly, and he commanded that we hear in the book of the law. And you know the command that you should not eat otherwise you will die. And death is the ultimate punishment in the law. You know, you have war, fire, death, and the exile. A third point, the parallelism is further enhanced in that the disobedience to the law brings about the punishment of death as well, either through fire, famine, sickness, or alternatively exile, especially in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, just as is the case at the end of Genesis 3. So the command and the threat will make sense later. And you know the ultimate punishment of the law that if you don't die in the city by fire or famine or sword, then you are exiled. And that, again, is what happens in the story of the Garden of Eden. So many, many questions that are raised by people and suddenly everybody wants to solve them theologically. You know, people keep talking and talking and talking about two and three. God said that he will kill Adam, make him die. He doesn't. Why? And so on. And all this will be solved later. The functionality of Yahweh Elohim in Genesis 2, 5 through 3, 24, when compared with simply Elohim in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, 
is further detectable in that the 20 instances of that phrase are interrupted, as I indicated earlier, by the four incidences of simply Elohim in 3, 1 through 5. That is, verses that encompass the conversation between the serpent and the woman, which conversation plants the seed of the man's contravention of the divine command. The most subtle or shrewd serpent among the animals twists the original the command was issued by Yahweh Elohim and not simply by Elohim as the serpents presented to the woman, a trap into which the woman trips by endorsing the suggestion of the serpent which incidentally itself was made by Yahweh Elohim, the actual source of the command. So he is rephrasing the command of Yahweh Elohim. Let's hear it. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. That's very interesting. And yet, he said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? This is verse 1. It's very stunning that the serpent was made by the Lord God and he twists his command. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you see, she answers the comment of the serpent. You shall not eat but the fruit of the tree, which technically is incorrect. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Again, in the Hebrew, it could be like God or like gods. Okay, so the serpent is playing against the original Yahweh Elohim. Again, we're not talking about essentials or theology or philosophy. Isn't it the same thing and so on? We're talking about hearing the text. In this regard, classical theology falls precisely in the same philosophical platonic trap by not taking seriously the scriptural intentional differentiation between Elohim and Yahweh Elohim. It gets lost in the futile debate regarding the capability of differentiating between good and evil and worse, the knowledge of God, instead of submitting to the divine command. That's very classic of theology. More on this matter later, we'll discuss it. For the time being, let me point out how many theologians fall into misquoting the following passage from Colossians due to their preference for philosophical knowledge over knowledge of God's will that is realized in leading a life according to that will, and I spoke enough on that in my commentary on Colossians. In 1.9.10, we hear, And so, from the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. We heard that you accepted the message. We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. People miss the fact that the last knowledge of God is a shortened formula of the knowledge of his will. In other words, you keep increasing in the not in theology because the stress is on leading a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and they make it so, and attending seminary classes. But obviously, this is not the intention of Paul. He had absolutely not in his purview schools of theology. So, 
the theologians or we theologians get mesmerized by the last phrase by hearing it out of the full context. All one has to do to be convinced of what I'm saying is to compare the seminaries or schools of theology setting where the students are trained to master the correct phraseology and the correct thought regarding the deity with the Pauline churches that are continually challenged, if not harassed, by his intransigence into bringing them to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. And in Philippians, we have something even more interesting. It's more developed and very powerful. Philippians 1, 6 through 11. And I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel thus about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. You see, the knowledge has to be poured into a life of love and action so that you may approve what is excellent and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Not approve mentally the correct theology. Yesterday I was listening to a program that was about chanting, introducing theologically every hymn. You know, my son Bassam told me I like very much the music, but not this length. It's unbelievable. So half of the presentation, at least third of it, is introducing the background. But this is not what Paul is saying. I made my comment before the last verse where he says, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruits of righteousness which come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And you remember my commentary on Galatians where Paul stressed the orthopraxis. They were not walking orthopodun. You have the ortho, but you never have orthodokeo cogitate correctly. You have to walk podun correctly, which is according to the commandment. So you see how when you are filled with a certain theological preconception, you start reading it back in the text of Genesis 2 and 3. That it's the debate with the serpent, how do you answer him and so on. You fall in this trap and the main thing is to remember that what God said was a command to the Adam. In order not to overburden our main topic now, which is Elohim and Yahweh Elohim, I'll deal later with the matter of good and evil. What does it mean, the good and the evil, and the discernment between the two? For the time being, let me wrap up by referring to my discussion of Genesis 4, 25, 26. You all recall that passage at the end, the last two verses of the Toledot of the heavens and the earth, which is the first self-standing literary section of Scripture, especially in the way it relates to our topic Elohim and Yahweh. Just as Genesis 1 revolves around Elohim and Genesis 2 3 around Yahweh Elohim, Genesis 4 is woven around Yahweh on its own, eight times in 16 verses, verses 1 through 16, which is the story of Cain. Follow verses 17 24 that cover Cain's genealogical descendants, that is, by the way, not entitled as Toledot, as will be done with Adam's progeny 
in chapter 5. So it is to be taken with the first part of this chapter. There is nothing out of the ordinary that happens with Cain, and the ultimate proof is that the genealogy of Cain is dismissed in Adam. The first son is neither Cain nor Abel, but Seth, who comes about at the end of four, which is very funny. Hear it, again, as literature. You heard plentifully about Cain and Abel and so on. And then chapter five, you have very importantly, and I stress this in my podcast and in my book, a recollection of the verses from Genesis 1. You know, you have a repetition that God, as God created Adam in his image and likeness, and so on and so forth. Adam communicates this image and likeness to his son, whose name is Seth. Very strange. No more Cain and Abel. So thus, chapter 4 is very functional. It is preparing for the appearance of Seth. However, although throughout the chapter, mainly between 1 and 16, remember, 1724 is the genealogy of Cain. But 1 through 16, we hear eight times of Yahweh, then suddenly, in verse 25, we have Elohim on its own, just before the last occurrence of Yahweh in verse 26. Okay, so we have again the sequence of Elohim. It is as though the author is drawing your attention, which he will complete at the beginning of 5 by referring to Genesis 1. God creates Adam in his own image and likeness. Here, we have a recalling of this interplay between Elohim and Yahweh. And notice the sequence. Elohim and then Yahweh. Although it is Elohim that controls the story of the new seed, Seth, that took the place of Abel, and understandably so, since Elohim is the originator behind all seeds, as in Genesis 1, 11, 12, and 29, it is Yahweh that takes over in verse 26, where the calling upon the name of the Lord comes about. Earlier I have mentioned that this is also a phrase from the books of the law which are connected to Yahweh. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network. 